everything is ready. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, you cannot see my face, but anyway, uh, I am Yung Jubang, the president of APCTP. And uh, uh, as you know, our center is going to have this uh, extensive lecture series on quantum computing, uh, consisting of, I think, 12 lectures in total. And we are very happy to have Dr. Uh, Kim Hanyoung, Isaac Kim, uh, to, to give uh, this extensive lecture series. And uh, I think it's needless to say that quantum computing or quantum information is the most fascinating and the, the fast growing field uh, in uh, many disciplines of science, but uh, also we all know all this uh, start from uh, fundamental physics uh, of quantum mechanics. So that uh, uh, it cover many different uh, disciplines of science uh, from uh, uh, theoretical physics and experimental uh, physics and also some engineering uh, uh, disciplines. So there are not many people, uh, researchers who can cover uh, this very interdisciplinary uh, uh, topics. Uh, so here, the today's speaker, Dr. Isaac Kim, is a, a very uh, active researcher in, in this area. And I think uh, uh, he has lots of experience in the long uh, uh, period of time in his career. So he's uh, one of the best uh, researchers who can cover this wide range of uh, topics. So uh, our center is very happy to have him. Once again, uh, we are very grateful uh, to Dr. Kim uh, to take this uh, uh, extensive uh, lecture series and despite of uh, his uh, busy schedule. Uh, with this, uh, I will hand over the, the chair to uh, Han Jong Un uh, to to preside uh, this lecture series, please, uh, Professor Jong Un Han. Okay, uh, thank you very much, President Pang. Uh, so I'm very excited to uh, have this opportunity to organize twelve lecture series on quantum computing uh, by Isaac Kim, who has recently moved to uh, University of California at UC Davis. Uh, so, um, I will be uh, very brief on the introduction of the speaker himself because he's already very well known in this field. And um, I'm sure you all showed up with great expectations for his talk and his lectures. Um, and uh, sitting through 12 lectures is not, uh, is not easy, when, especially when it extends over a three week period. So uh, I'm sure some of you will not be able to attend all of the lectures, which is why I have asked for permission to have these lectures recorded and so that you can come back and revisit some of the missing links later on. Uh, but I'm sure that the best way to learn is by listening to all the lectures in real time. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure the uh, lectures will be given in English, but you are most welcome to present your questions at any time during the lecture uh, in Korean, and he will be able to answer you in uh, both Korean and English. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, let's uh, give a round uh, of welcome to Dr. Kim and let's get started. Uh. Thank you. That was very kind of you. And I'm very happy to be able to um, give a course on quantum computing. Um, yeah, so it's a, uh, uh, there, there will be 12 lectures, uh, six days, uh, two hours each. And uh, the, the main idea behind this course is to, uh, A, first um, make the course geared towards physicists who understands quantum mechanics very well and also focus uh, more on um, quantum simulation side of quantum computing, because it's a very big subject. And in 12 course, there's no way I can uh, talk about everything. Um, okay, so 
here's the, you know, okay, so I guess that's the basic goal. Uh, we will talk about the review of quantum simulation algorithms with a focus on uh, state-of-the-art methods. So the, the methods that people actually uh, are being developed in recent papers. So uh, my hope is that I can explain the key ideas behind these papers, uh, at, at least towards the end of the lecture series. And as I said, I will assume that you're comfortable with the standard quantum mechanics, uh, like the bracket notations and one rule and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, today will be a bit uh, elementary. So for most of you, the physics part will be not very uh, interesting. Uh, and I will just talk about the basics of quantum computation. Um, and um, so uh, later down the course, uh, you'll see that we will um, use certain notations a lot. And we will also um, make certain assumptions. And the goal of today's lecture is to explain beforehand uh, why, why I'm making these choices and what these notations mean. And uh, if you have any questions during the course, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to ask me. You can just uh, jump right in. OK, so uh, quantum computing, uh, it's very popular these days. And uh, this is a slide that I stole from a, like a, uh, a conference called Q2B. It's a conference that is held in Palo Alto every year uh, around November or December. And it's an industry conference. And uh, it's basically a conference in which uh, a lot of industrial players, um, if you're a quantum computing company, they come over and talk about their uh, hardware capabilities. And if you're a software company, they tell you about the service that you provide. And if you're other companies, uh, you come over and talk about uh, what kind of industrial problems that you hope to be able to solve with the quantum computer. And as you can see, uh, this uh, trend is certainly increasing. Um, and certainly there are lots of interesting questions that are being asked there, but um, it's still the main consensus is that the most uh, important application of quantum computing would be a simulation of uh, interacting quantum many body systems. Uh, either spin systems or electrons. So um, let's, we're gonna, and we're gonna talk about that. And before we begin, it's important to realize that uh, the quantum computers that we have today are not very powerful. So just to give you a comparison, uh, in your laptop, uh, you can write a very simple C, C++ code to do let's say 64 bit integer addition and you can very easily check for yourself that it's, it takes less than a nanosecond. But on the other hand, the quantum computers that are available today, uh, even for the simplest uh, operation that you can imagine, it takes at least uh, 10 nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds or even microseconds. And uh, to uh, perform the same uh, integer addition on a quantum computer, you need roughly speaking tens of layers of these gates and that will lead to a roughly 100 to 10,000 fold slowdown, uh, even compared to your laptop. We're not even comparing to the, uh, like the, the data center type of computers. So, and everybody's saying that quantum computer is more efficient than a classical computer. And clearly uh, the numbers that we have here is in odds with that uh, statement. So um, an important question is uh, what's, what's really going on here? And uh, when we say a uh, quantum computer is efficient, uh, the word efficient has a very particular meaning. And this is because a uh, quantum computer, at least in the beginning, uh, was uh, developed in close analogy with the development of uh, classical computational theory. And in these theories, uh, what, what you usually think about is that you have a problem and you want to uh, solve this problem using some algorithm. And obviously, if the problem size gets larger and larger, uh, you need more time and space to actually solve that problem. And usually, you're not exactly interested in the precise form of this scaling. Like, uh, you're not interested in the precise form of the, uh, the way in which this time or space grows. But you are only interested in the qu its qualitative behavior. In other words, we are interested in the asymptotic scaling in the limit that the size of the problem uh, grows to infinity. And the key point is that in that regime, uh, these constants uh, between that, that 
well, uh, I, I just said that for a particular computation, the quantum computer is roughly 10,000 fold slower than a classic computer. And the important thing is in the asymptotic uh, regime, uh, these constants uh, matter less. Of course, that doesn't mean that in practice it doesn't. I mean, it do, it, the, in practice, constants do matter. But I'm just saying that um, when we say word efficient, uh, we tend to not think about the constants. <clears throat> and the, the important point is that while the existing quantum computers are very small and slow, uh, eventually, uh, if we look back in history, technologies, they usually do improve over time. So the hope is that one day, the quantum computers will be much larger and uh, faster. So, so this regime, we'll be able to re reach this regime uh, and uh, we'll be able to achieve certain quantum speed ups. And just to be concrete, uh, one good example would be Shor's algorithm. So I, I will not talk about the details about the Shor's algorithm because we're gonna mostly talk about quantum simulation, but still a good example to show the difference between quantum computer and the classical computer. So I'm sure many of you know that uh, Peter Shor, uh, who's over here, uh, famously came up with the factoring algorithm in 1994. So the factoring algorithm is a algorithm such that if you're given an integer, let's say something like this, consisting of uh, n bits, um, let's say, oh, okay. Let's say we have a binary representation in n bits. Then uh, Peter Shor showed that there's an algorithm that uses quantum gates, uh, which I will define shortly. Uh, uh, and the algorithm uh, that he proposed, uh, the number of computational steps that you need uh, scales uh, roughly like C times n to the Q, uh, up plus some self-correction terms. And on the other hand, uh, uh, still currently the best known uh, method uh, to uh, using a classical computer to factor this number, a uh, scale is roughly like this, uh, some constant times exponential of some constant times n to the one third. And there's some like log terms, but let, let's not um, care too much about that. And uh, to compare the actual time that it takes to uh, run this computation on a classical computer and a quantum computer, um, well, obviously for the quantum case, you just need to multiply the time to execute a quantum gate times C and Q, where TQ is the time to implement an individual gate on a quantum computer. And on a classical computer, it would be the TC times C prime exponential. Uh, and I, I think uh, somebody is not muted. Uh, sorry. Uh, Anyway, um, okay, so the even though, uh, TQ is much larger than TC, um, uh, as N gets larger and larger, eventually uh, this uh, total time to compute this thing on a classical computer will exceed the total time it takes to compute on the quantum computer. And uh, that's why we care about these asymptotic scalings. Uh, and because that's the way people think about algorithms, uh, it's important to understand uh, what, what these uh, notations mean. So if you look at these papers, you will see all sorts of um, uh, symbols. Um, so in, in physics papers, sometimes people do use big O, nota big o notation. Um, you, maybe some of you have seen notations like this, order 10 to the two or like order 10 to the five or something like that in, in some physics papers, I, I've seen them. And of course, these are not like very precisely defined, but when you look at them, you sort of get an idea. So for instance, this means a few hundred usually. I mean, that's what people are trying to say. And this is like 10 to the five times some constant, which is not too big, like let's say like three or five. So that's um, that's the physics figure notation. And it's important to realize that when computer scientists uh, write big O, uh, they mean something that's different. So, um, 
there, there are uh, four things um, which all seem somewhat complicated, but a good way to think about this is the following. So the, the most common thing that you, you will see is uh, the actual big O notation. And you can think of this as sort of an upper bound of Fn. So, so here I spell out the definition. Uh, what it says is that there's a constant such that for a sufficiently large n for some constant n not, uh, Fn is a c time smaller or equal to c times gfn. So a good example would be uh, something like this. Suppose the exact form of f of n is is of some function like this. Then um, for a sufficiently large, um, let's see, and this is, you can show that smaller or equal to C prime times N to the Q for some sufficiently large constant, let's say 10 to the 10. I mean, this is something that you can very easily check. And therefore, in this case, we simply say that Fn is O, big O, uh, N to the Q. And this is just uh, giving a very coarse upper bound on f of n uh, in the limit that n goes to infinity. And so think of it as a upper bound and usually uh, people use this to uh, give, give a worst case um, uh, performance guarantee on the algorithm. So for example, in the Shores algorithm, um, I already told you that uh, go back, I already told you that uh, this guy uses at least C and Q uh, quantum gates, where uh, C is some constant. In that case, uh, we'll just say that Shor's algorithm runs in uh, in order n cubed time. And there are these other things which are used less, but uh, they're still important. So this big O notation, big omega notation, uh, you can think of it as a lower bound. So you can see um, all these clauses, there is a constant C such that for a sufficiently large blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the exact same statement goes like right here. But, um, uh, uh, I will just not repeat that. And the thing is, uh, omega n, uh, this, 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 this can be thought as a, like a lower bound of f, f of n. And this is sometimes, this is usually used to show that a certain algorithm takes at least a certain amount of time. And sometimes uh, you can actually um, get both the lower bound and the upper bound. And um, in that case, you just have like a theta of g of n. Uh, which is in some sense uh, very uh, close to the physics big O notation, physics uh, big O notation. Because in physics big O notation, uh, when we write something like this, like order 100, we don't mean uh, something that's like smaller than 100. It means like 100 times some small constant. So uh, this theta of g of n, uh, you can think of it as like a, in the physics language, like a big O of G of N. And lastly, uh, you, you sometimes see these things. It's a, it's a O, it's still a O, but it's a small O notation. And a good way to remember this is that this is a sub-leading contribution in some sense. So for example, um, let's say um, F of N, grows as n to the one half. Then this is um, little o of n because in the n goes to infinity limit, n to the one half divided by n, uh, that goes to zero. And these things are usually used, uh, like those you have some algorithm and you um, estimated its runtime. And let's say the runtime, 3n, 
n to the one half or something. And in the n going to infinity limit, obviously this uh, second term will be subleading. So it'll contribute much less. So in that case, if you're not really interested in specifying the precise form, you can simply write this as three n plus little, uh, little o. And uh, you, you can immediately see that even though you don't know the precise form of this, the important thing is this is subleading. So this is still the dominant term. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, if not, well, this is a short summary. Uh, I think the slides will be shared late, uh, later. So uh, again, the first one is an upper bound, the second one is a lower bound, and uh, the third one, it's both the upper and lower bound, and the last one is a subleading contribution. Okay. All right, so we're still talking about algorithm. And uh, in algorithms, uh, we have this notion of complexity. And roughly speaking, uh, uh, okay, so there, there, there are all sorts of complexity uh, and obviously uh, we won't go into all those details, but the thing that I want to focus on is the time complexity of the algorithm. And this estimates the uh, amount of time, quantifies the amount of time needed to run the algorithm. And here, uh, the big O notation is very useful because uh, without the big O notation, to actually write down an expression for the time complexity, you have to first, uh, well, uh, know uh, how much time it takes to execute individual gates. And also, uh, and that, that obviously depends on different computers. And uh, this big O notation is a very convenient way to very coarsely, um, uh, explain uh, how much time we would need to run an algorithm without going into these uh, details. And, okay. And I, I've told you that uh, the word uh, efficient actually has a very specific meaning. And uh, in complexity theory, uh, this is uh, very important. So. We, we say, uh, when, when computer scientists say that an algorithm is efficient, uh, we don't mean that it can be run in a very short amount of time, like one nanosecond. We mean that um, the way in which this time complexity grows is only gr grows polynomially with the system size. So one example is that is the Shor's algorithm. We've already showed, uh, uh, established, well, okay, I, I guess we didn't establish, but we know that Shor's algorithm has a quantum time complexity of order n cube. And therefore, uh, this is uh, efficient because it scales uh, polynomially with the uh, size of the problem. And for instance, uh, hypothetically, if you have an algorithm with the time complexity of something like this, so this is a very big number. And even though this is a polynomial, it's a uh, polynomial with a very high degree. So even if you put in like n equals one or two, you get the number which is much larger than the number of atoms in the universe or something. Uh, so this is obviously not, this algorithm would not be practical, but still this algorithm, we will call it then as efficient because the constant doesn't matter. And this uh, n to the 10 to the 23, 10 to the 23 is still a constant independent of n. Okay. And sim similarly, um, we say when we have two different algorithms, we may want to compare them to understand which is better. Uh, and of course, in practice, um, maybe algorithm A will be better than B, but uh, let's say, sorry, algorithm B may be better than algorithm A, but if algorithm A has a complexity of 10 to the 100 times N, and algorithm B has a complexity that grows like this, eventually, as N goes to infinity, the this second algorithm, uh, its time complexity will grow much faster. So in that sense, um, um, yeah, 
this uh, first uh, time the, the first time complex the algorithm with the first time complexity uh, is more efficient than the algorithm uh, with the same uh, time with the second time complexity. And this is a uh, you might think that this is very weird, and in some sense it is because it, it looks like we're not really interested in uh, finite size uh, effects and everything is at the end of the day finite. But I should mention that in practice, um, usually uh, if, you, if, if somebody finds an algorithm with a, like a reasonable, like a polynomial complexity uh, in the input system, input uh, problem size, usually people end up uh, making it better and better so that it becomes actually practical. So it, it's not always the case, but usually this happens. So in some core sense, this is a uh, actually reasonable notion of uh, efficiency. Okay, so now let's talk about the difference and similarities between the quantum and classical computing. Okay. So- Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so the category of complexity uh, here is uh, polynomial, uh, exponential, and uh, can we have, uh, uh, for instance, doubly exponential? Uh, uh, you, you, you could. Um, we could have that. Um, so, but usually, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can certainly have that, but how should I say? Well, okay, uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, but usually people make a distinction between polynomial and not polynomial. So uh, not polynomial doesn't mean that it's exponential because you can have, for example, order n to the uh, log n. And uh, this is, uh, this grows uh, slower than uh, exponential function but it grows faster than any polynomial function. Okay, there are many categories, okay. Yeah, there are many such things, yeah. Okay, so what are the similarities between and the, the quantum and classical computing? So quantum, well, let, let's first talk about similarities. The classical computing, we all know that uh, the elementary unit of information are, is, is bit. And in computers, we have many bits of information. And we can process that information using elementary gates, such as AND gate, NOT gate, and NAND gate. Uh, in particular, uh, NAND gate, this will appear later uh, in this lecture again. So I'll just write down what that is. So let's say we have two bits, x, y. And then the truth table is this. So it's basically the opposite of AND. And NAND gate is special because uh, just by itself, it can produce the uh, uh, produce any uh, classical computation. So in that sense, uh, this gate is universal. And Quantum computing is similar. Uh, I'm sorry, I did yeah. not get that point. Why is it universal? Oh, in uh, any classical comp computation can be broken down into a sequence of NAND gates. Uh, it is, it's just a fact. But that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's not true if you only have NOT gates, for example. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I was worried that maybe some people in the audience might not be familiar with the idea of a universal gate. Uh, right, yes, yeah, so yeah, thanks, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so quantum computer, uh, it's similar except uh, uh, instead of bits, we have qubits. And qubit is just really a, a two-dimensional two Hilbert space. Of course, uh, just by uh, it, simply having two-dimensional space is not gonna be very interesting, 
So uh, in practice, we need uh, many qubits to do an interesting computation. And, and in that case, the Hilbert space structure is a uh, tensor product. So the global Hilbert space is, if we have n qubits, it will be simply a tensor product of n um, copies of two-dimensional Hilbert spaces. And a canonical basis vector, basis set that people often choose is um, something like this, where X is a n-bit string. So for example, um, X is something like this. Or if you have like n bits, literally. And um, like classical computers, we have one, uh, we have gates, we have a notion of gates. And gates are simply unitary transformations Um, except uh, we don't consider completely arbitrary unitary transformations. Uh, we consider unitaries that act on a, a small number of qubits, for instance, of one qubit or two qubit. So for instance, if we have a one qubit gate, this is just a uh, two by two matrix such that, um, Let's say we have a one qubit gate uh, U acting on qubit K, then it'll look like this. It's action on an arbitrary basis that will look like this. So without loss of generality, we can write down uh, X as follows. Uh, where x1, x2, these are all just bits. So. Okay. And this is simply defined as as follows. And you can say the similar thing for two qubit gates. Uh, in that case, you simply specify the two qubits that the unitary acts on, and you simply apply the unitary transformation on those two qubits. So you still have some notion of gates in quantum computing. But um, there are some important differences because in quantum gate, I said that uh, all the gates are unitary uh, and therefore they must be reversible because if we have a unitary U, then we know that u u dagger equals u dagger u is equal to identity. So u dagger is actually u inverse. So inverse always exists. However, if we look at uh, some of the classical gates, so I told you about the NAND gate, for example. So just to, let's just rewrite uh, the truth table. So, if we view the left-hand side as the input and view the uh, uh, right side as the output, then the input state space is four, well, four dimensional and the output uh, only consists of two values. So there is no way that this, um, if you view the left-hand side as the input and view the right-hand side as the output, uh, there is no way that this can be made to be uh, reversible. So this process is obviously not unitary. So, um, uh, people actually in the beginning, actually even before quantum computing became very big because of Shor, uh, people uh, did ask this question. So it, it wasn't even clear at first that if a quantum computer can do everything that a classical computer can do. But uh, in some sense, uh, this question was uh, answered uh, um, sort of in a different context. And uh, this was uh, answered in a context in which people asked, 
can you do a classical computation reversibly, like in, independent of whether you can do quantum computer or not? Uh, people simply asked, um, why, why uh, like, do, do you want to, uh, can, can we actually do a reversible computation? And this is because uh, Landauer uh, shows that uh, if you want to erase information, then you need to um, uh, dissipate, uh, you need to produce some heat. Uh, and obviously that means that the larger the computation gets, if you uh, use uh, irreversible gates a lot, uh, that will dissipate a lot of heat. So uh, people are interested in the fundamental limit on uh, uh, computation that uses the, that dissipates the minimum amount of heat. So th that was the context. And it, it turns out that the reversible computation is actually possible. And this was shown by Charlie Bennett in 1933. And the idea is to use uh, what is known as the Toffoli gate, which will actually play an important role in quantum computing as well. So what is a Toffoli gate? Well, I'll first write down the truth table and then you can uh, think about what, what this truth table means. So the Toffoli gate, uh, this guy acts on three bits. So you have three input bits and three output bits. So I'll call them as X, Y, and Z. And after you apply to Foley, I'll uh, call the outputs as X prime, Y prime, Z prime. Okay, so this will take a little while, but uh, I'll just bear with me. So these are the inputs. Um, So we have all eight of them. And the Toffoli gate acts as follows. So the X and Y, they remain the same. So I'll just copy them. And, uh, Z and, 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 and the Z changes actually. And they change, uh, the G zero is changed to one and vice versa, only if X and Y are uh, both um, one. So, Let's see. So in this case, nothing changes, nothing changes, nothing changes, but now uh, X and Y are both one, and therefore uh, we have uh, we, uh, zero is changed to one. So let's see. So you see that zero is changed to one. And similarly, um, oops, um, and in the lower half, of this table, uh, you have ones because um, uh, uh, x prime uh, and of x x and y is uh, zero, so nothing is really happening. And but then, uh, if x and y are both one, then we uh, well the end clause is satisfied, and therefore one is changed to zero. A more compact way to represent this is the following. So let's say uh, x, you have x, y, and z, and this is changed into x comma, y comma, z, and x comma, y. So you might wonder what this means. This means uh, addition mod two, okay? And you can see that this is a correct expression. So what, what you can see is that, well, okay, first of all, let's, let's just make sure that this is actually reversible. And you can easily see that that is the case because if you apply this operation twice, um, you get X comma Y comma Z going to X comma Y comma Z and X comma Y, and then if you apply to fully again, then you get, you basically add the same thing twice. So if, if, if there are zero, then you're adding zero. So that's fine, that's uh, adding zero. 
if, if you're if all of them are one, uh, uh, two mod two is zero. So therefore, this is x comma y comma z. So Toffoli is uh, the inverse of the Toffoli is itself. So this is a reversible operation. Moreover, uh, you can see that if you set uh, z to be a zero as an initial condition, then x comma y comma zero becomes simply x comma y comma uh, and x comma y. And um, and is basically, sorry, nand is followed, nand is and followed by, uh, better to write it, nand is and followed by not. And not is a reversible operation because um, not changes zero to one and one to zero. So that's clearly, clearly reversible. So the point is, um, if you have a Toffoli and a not operation, both of them are reversible operations. And from this, you can uh, generate NAND, okay? The price you pay is that you need this uh, extra uh, register. So there is this, there's this zero that, that you're initializing. Uh, you're initializing some of the bits to zero and you're storing some, this intermediate result in this register. But you can uh, compute this AND operation and, and in fact, NAND operation. And because uh, NAND gate is universal in a sense that any classical computation can be decomposed into a sequence of NAND gates, uh, Using Toffoli and not, you can actually perform uh, arbitrary uh, classical computation. And moreover, uh, remember, uh, if you have a one NAND operation, um, that can be implemented by using one Toffoli and one not operation. So uh, the number of gates oh, at most doubles. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm getting ahead of myself and probably I'm wrong. Yeah. But maybe more generally, can you say that if you have some sort of matrix, which is not uh, reversible, let's say mm -hmm. the matrix is not unitary or maybe it's not orthogonal, but perhaps you can mm -hmm. always find a way to sort of embed that into a larger matrix that is uh, orthogonal or unitary and therefore reversible. Uh, uh, that is possible, uh, but uh, the matrix cannot have a very large norm. So if it has a very large eigenvalue, then um, this will be, I believe this will be impossible. Um, but if the, let's see. Okay, so this, if the eigen, if the eigenvalues of the matrix are less than one, I believe this is possible. Yeah, mm. but we, we, we can talk about this uh, more. Uh, I mean, this question will actually arise like towards the later part of the course, but I, I think what I said is correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, just to conclude here, um, the point is, uh, single NAND can be replaced by single Toffoli and single NAND. So, uh, in in your if your original computation could be done efficiently using NAND gates, the same computation can be done efficiently using Toffoli's and NAND gates, because you only multiply by a constant vector of two. Yeah, yeah. So any efficient classical algorithm can be made reversible uh, while maintaining the efficiency. That's a very important result. And it turns out that, uh, I won't show you, but it turns out that Toffoli gate and not gates can be ex implemented using one and two cubic gates, okay? Um, so people have shown this. And therefore, uh, any efficient, and, and uh, this, as you can imagine, Toffoli uh, viewed as a unitary matrix, is a finite dimensional unitary matrix. And one and two cubic gates, these are also finite dimensional matrices. So you can imagine Toffoli gate is decomposed into a finite sequence of one and two cubic gates. And indeed this is the case. And therefore, again, uh, 
uh, given any efficient classical computation, you can uh, break that down into NAND gates and then TOEFL and NOT gates and then into one and two gates. And here you only incur a constant vector cost. So when it comes down to the question of can a quantum computer can do uh, what classical computers can do, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, more precisely, uh, any efficient classical computation can be done uh, efficiently on a quantum computer as well. So in that sense, uh, quantum computer uh, at the very least uh, includes what the classical computers can do. But of course, uh, um, a nice thing about quantum computers is that they can do certain uh, other things that the classical computers cannot do. So let's talk about that. Uh, I, I guess uh, I'll only give you a very cartoon picture here and we'll see more uh, explicit examples down the road, but um, yeah. Uh, what, what I think is very cool about quantum computation is that you can do reversal computation, reversible computation, but in superposition. Uh, but th there is a caveat. So um, when, when, when I write, uh, things in words like this, um, there, are, there are actually two versions that sound pretty reasonable. Um, and uh, the first version uh, is uh, actually possible, uh, provided that f of x can be actually computed on a classical computer. But the second one is uh, generally impossible. And you can sort of see why the second thing is impossible um, because, well, I already showed you this NAND example. So I won't uh, fill in the truth table, but the point is the input uh, is to, uh, consists of two bits, uh, four different possibilities. The output has only two possibilities. So uh, this, 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 uh, this cannot work because um, this, this process, the, the process that maps x into f of x cannot be unitary. So the second one is not possible, but the first one is. Um, and when you look at um, things like this, uh, you may think that this is like um, trivially true, or you might think that it's um, not obvious why this is true. And I will say that, uh, this is actually a somewhat non-trivial result. And it's because of the following. So at first you might think that because we can do reversible computation, uh, we can simply just run the Toffoli's and CNOT gates to actually uh, get this result. But uh, this is not totally wrong, but it's not also exactly true. And the reason is the following. So, if we were to, so let's, let's remember uh, what, what we tried to do when we changed NAND gates into Toffoli gates. So we, we did, what we did is that we had an extra register, which was initialized to a bit value of zero. And then after we apply the Toffoli, we got X comma Y comma uh, and X comma Y. So if we um, try to do this uh, just in the quantum mechanical regime, um, we, we, we will get something like this. So we have X, Y is zero and we're Uh, X and Y are arbitrary bits. And after you apply the Toffoli gate, quantum, uh, you'll get X, Y, and X comma Y. But if you, for instance, use the AND gate one more time, uh, you need to introduce another qubit. something like this. 
So maybe you want to do something like this. X, Y, Z, and, and you apply the AND gate one more time. Let's say here you apply the AND gate between Z and the AND of X comma Y. I guess we'll get something like this. So uh, let's say this was the actual function that we wanted to calculate. Then you, you sort of immediately see the problem. So we, we so this all, all of this uh, works for all, any uh, input uh, values of x, y, and z. So by linearity, um, x, y, so for arbitrary uh, state vector of this form, after applying these topolis, um, you get uh, a state vector of this form. And what we would what what we would want is to actually um, have this part um, to, to, to something uh, different, like a fixed value of zero. Because uh, here, um, like uh, what we want to do here is that, uh, sorry, over here is that given x and zero, we want to how we want to define, we want to transform the zero state into uh, f of x, but uh, we don't want to have anything extra. So we don't want to keep any like intermediate computation results. Um, so that's why uh, this is not totally obvious that the, the fact that we can actually do this is not totally obvious. And there's a, uh, there's a standard trick to, uh, solve this problem, it's called as uncomputation. And this is the standard way to uh, remove this uh, intermediate uh, computation result. So I'll give you a simple example from which I think the generalization is very straightforward. So uh, here I give you a slightly more general version of the problem that I discussed in the previous slide. So in the previous slide, I applied AND gates twice. So those were my functions. But slightly more generally, let's say I want to implement um, this operation. So I want to begin with uh, x tensor zero state, and I want to transform that into x tensor f of g of x. And I'm given an ability to compute um, um, f of x and also uh, g, g, g of x. Okay, so how would I do that? So as a first step, um, so uh, I, I will simply have uh, two different registers. And what I would do is that first, I will implement uh, UG so that, what was your question? Uh, okay, so I, I do that and then I implement um, I guess it would be convenient to specify uh, where this UG is acting. So UG is acting on these two uh, registers and UF, okay, that's better. And UF is acting on these two registers. So after you do that, you have X, Gx, f, g of x. And now uh, we want to somehow um, remove um, this guy. So what do you do 
is that you, you simply uh, apply the inverse. over these two registers. And uh, the inverse, uh, if you think about it, it should uh, map the original state back to itself. So um, this simply uh, removes this g of x and push, pushes this back to the zero state. So we see that we have indeed implemented the desired operation. Um, so if you look at these um, first and the third register, uh, that state has a change from x uh, tensor f of g of x. And the remaining thing, the second register that's in the zero state, so it's uh, totally decoupled for, from everything else. So for, for all intents and purposes, the second register, it's as if it only participate in the middle, but at the end of the computation, it's uh, it doesn't really affect any of the other qubits. So this way, uh, by repeating the same uh, trick, uh, no matter how many uh, intermediate computation results we stored, we can always remove them. So the, the point of all of this is that if you can uh, compute a function uh, efficiently on a classical computer, independent of like how many bits you need in the middle, you can always compute that function on a quantum computer as well uh, by removing these intermediate uh, computation results. Yes, so that's what I just said. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, that's kind of interesting, but the real question is, uh, can quantum computers uh, provide a speed up? And uh, well, I guess the answer is yes, because uh, well, uh, otherwise people wouldn't really work on quantum computing. So uh, there are some uh, uh, algorithms for which quantum computers uh, do provide speed ups. Uh, the famous example is factoring. So you already talked about that, although very uh, schematically, I mean, we, we only, only about its performance. And another uh, interesting, an important application is quantum simulation. And in these cases, uh, it's not like there is a mathematical theorem that says that we have an exponential speed up. Uh, what is true is that with a quantum computer, we have a, we have a polynomial time quantum algorithm for either factoring or certain simulation problems. But, and, and we think classically these problems uh, scale exponentially because smart people have worked on them. And uh, so far, nobody came up with a polynomial time algorithm. But that doesn't mean that it, it that doesn't prove that it's uh, impossible to have polynomial time classical algorithm. But uh, yeah, so I just wanted to put it out there. And there are some more modest speedups, uh, polynomial speedups. These are things like uh, database search optimization and Monte Carlo simulation. But here the speedup is uh, less dramatic. So it's something like this. So let's say a classical computer, uh, your runtime is order n and uh, maybe let's say order, order two to the n and on the the quantum case, it's lower and divide by two or something. So obviously this this is, it would have been much more impressive if uh, the quantum is scales polynomial with n, but uh, in these problems, nobody believes that's actually possible. So the, these are more modest speedups. Okay, so uh, I wanna take a break a little bit uh, uh, to, uh, in, in case any, anybody wants more wants to have, ask questions. Uh, just to summarize what we've discussed so far, uh, the important point that I want to emphasize is that anything you can do classically efficiently, you can do quantumly efficiently as well. Um, and there are some quantum algorithms for which uh, we have expect exponential uh, speed up for the classical algorithms. Okay, uh, so let me pause a little bit and maybe take some questions. 
오케이. 아, 질문은 한국말로 하셔도 됩니다. 그럼 따로 질문이 없으시면 은한 5분 쉬고 잠깐 물한 모금씩 드시고 그리고 5분 뒤에 다시 만나는 걸로 하겠습니다. 예, 감사합니다. 5분 뒤에 뵙겠습니다. 네.